Well, we're in the book of Samuel, if you have your Bible with you. We are looking in 1 Samuel 15. If you uh, have the note sheet in front of you, you'll see that all the points, and thankfully the Scriptures are there today as we work on the screen, but the Scriptures are all there for you. And we're talking about being a man of God where He places you. And it's an unusual uh, sermon, maybe, because if you look at the text, uh, Saul is everything opposite of what we're talking about. And as I prayed through the text, I just thought, what would be the opposite of the way he went? And why is God replacing him with David? And you'll see David picks up these characteristics. And David is a, such a Christ-like figure when he's walking in the Spirit, and he's such a foolish man when he's walking in the flesh. But Saul is even worse. David loved God. He just didn't mature in some areas. Saul pretended to love God, and he loved people more than God. And you'll see it in the text. He, he loved the praise of people more than the honor of the Lord. And that's one thing a man must give up, and a woman or anybody in leadership. I mean, it doesn't matter who it is. This applies to everybody. But I, I focused on Deborah a few weeks ago about being a woman of God. just wanted to turn around and talk about being a man of God. That one thing a man must decide and must come to a place that Jesus Christ is Lord of his life, period. He's the Lord of his finances. He's the Lord of his marriage, of his parenting, of his sexual life. He's the Lord of his heart that he's willing to forgive. And that point, until you, until you come to a point where you surrender in Christ, if that never happens, you'll never be able to walk in faith. You'll never be able to walk in a way that pleases God. So this is about being a man of God where he places you. Now remember, the people had demanded their own king. They had said, we don't want you to decide for us what king we get. We want our own king. And so they told God, we'll call on you if we need you. You know, we're going to say that we love you. We're going to say that we follow you. But we're just going to live as practical atheists. But if we really get in trouble, we'll call on you. A lot of people live that way. But they said, do not pick a king for us. We'll pick our own king. And he said, okay, but if you pick your own king, here's what's going to happen. And we went through that last week. And he said, your king who walks in the flesh, who doesn't walk in the spirit, who walks in his own desires, he's going to heavily tax you. He's going to send your sons to war. He's going to misuse your daughters. He's going to take your money and re, re, re uh, move it to somebody else. He's going to move it to other people. And he's going to do all these things. And we talked about it. And he said, okay, is that what you want? And they said, yes. And he said, I'm going to hand you over. And those are some scary words. So Saul is going to be removed as king because he has the same heart. Chapter 15, verse 1, if you look there with me, if you've got your Bible open, it says Samuel. Now remember, Samuel's the prophet. He goes to Saul, and he says, the Lord, and you'll notice that's capital L-O-R-D again. It means Yahweh, the one true self-existing God who is a covenant God, a promise God. He keeps his promises. The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. And so he goes to him, and he says, you know, really the basics of life are pretty simple, Saul. It's really pretty simple. It's kind of difficult at times. It's so impossible at times again in the flesh, but it's really simple. And so he gets to the basics with him, and he says, if you're going to be king, first of all, number one on your note sheet, he said, trust in the Lord and his word. He said, that's the main thing in life for a man or for any leader or any person who wants to honor the Lord. He said, put your trust fully in the Lord and in his word. We've talked about this a lot, but I just want to remind you, doctrine is important. We live in an age where doctrine is not important. We live in an age where it's all about uh, emotions and music and excitement and what do you have for my family and what programs do you have and what do you have for my kids. But doctrine is important. It's the key thing. Doctrine is just a word that says the knowledge and study of God. Make it your life pursuit to know God and to study God. And that's what he told Saul. He said, if you're going to be king, you must make it your life pursuit. You must go at it with passion from the Holy Spirit to know who God is and to know what he's about and to know his ways because people are going to follow you. 
And they need to follow you towards God, not towards your own passions and towards your own desires. And so he says, you need to trust in the Lord and trust in his word. He, he ends verse 1 saying, hear, hearken to, take it in, appropriate them, apply them, listen to the words of the Lord. Now, we don't draw near to people we don't trust. We don't draw near to people we don't trust. And we don't trust people we don't know. So when you look at many people's lives, where they are spiritually, you can understand what's going on in their life. They don't know God well through his word. We don't draw near to people we don't trust. And doctrine's important in many ways. You can defend the gospel. You make decisions. The word is a lamp to your feet. But the biggest reason why you want to know God is to get to trust him, to draw near to him. Look at that psalm on your note sheet. Psalm 9, 10, it says... Those who know your name, they will do what? They'll put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. The main reason to know his name, that means his character, his ways, his attributes, all that he is, his ways, his attributes, his character, all that he says, is so that they can put their trust in you. He says, know him so you can trust him. And you, you don't forsake those who know you and seek you and trust you. In other words, you can start to live with confidence and boldness if you trust the Lord. In town right now, there's a so-called prophet. He believes he's an apostolic prophet. And several people have shared this with me because one of the things he said was is that people like me who get up and preach the Word of God for 45, 50 minutes, we should have satanic angels attack us so that we can't sleep. Now, I've never heard of another Christian asking for satanic demons to attack another Christian. I, that's, that's beyond cray-cray. But I, be, 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 besides that, I mean, what Christian would do that? But this, this movement that keeps coming back, it just keeps coming back and coming back, it dies and comes back, that there's new revelation, and you've got to have this apostolic prophet or preacher, or special anointed person, as though you'd have to carry him around to your graduation party, you know, and carry him around everywhere so that he could speak the Word of God. And you've got to put some loose-leaf paper in your Bible that equals what Jesus said and Peter said and Paul said. Never mind that Ephesians 2.20 says the apostles and prophets were the foundation of the church, and we're 2,000 years later. This is not the foundation. We're not on the foundation anymore. There are no more apostles and prophets who walked with Jesus or who proclaimed Jesus coming. That reminds 2 Corinthians 12, 12, that he said apostles and prophets can do miracles, signs, and wonders as Jesus did. That means he could heal people and raise people from the dead and heal the lame and blind out in the open, Paul says. Not this nonsense on a stage where somebody gets... No, out in the open, on a regular basis. He said if you don't see that and know that they didn't walk with Jesus, they're not an apostle or a prophet. He says, you have all you need. I want to remind you again, even in the church, the enemy is always going to attack the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, the sufficiency of his cross, and the sufficiency of his word. It's always going to be, you need Jesus plus something, the cross plus something, and the word plus something. The reason I say that is, I prayed for that man, I feel sorry for that man, I feel sorry for the people listening to him, but I pray he would be silenced. I pray he be removed, just like Paul did. But the reason I say that is that's where Saul's going to go. He's going to go so far down that he's finally going to go to a witch, and he's going to say, give me more revelation. What God's gave me is not enough. He's going to get some real trouble because of his heart. Be a man of the Lord and his word. Men, take your pen right down there What's God telling you? What's your next step to be deeper relationally with God? What's your next step? Is it to begin to meet with Him on a regular basis? Has that drifted? Is it to begin to meet with people in community? Is it begin to apply what you already know? It, you most likely already know what the next step is. It's about doing it. It's about taking the risk in faith and doing it. What's your next step to know the Lord better, to know His Word better? What's He put on your heart? from his word or from people that spoke to you. That's the calling. Number two, he told him to fully obey the Lord. So Samuel comes to him and he says, Saul, if you're going to be king, if you're going to be leader, and if you're going to be a man of God, you must learn to fully obey the Lord. Partial 
Obedience is just disobedience. It's another way to say, I'm going to, I'm going to choose my way. I'm going to choose what I'm going to do. So in verse 2, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of the armies. He's the Lord of the angels. He's the Lord of the heavens and the earth. He said, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go, now he's telling King Saul, go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him. But put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So the severity of the passage again makes us stop, okay? What is going on here that a man and a group of people would kill men, women, children, donkeys, sheep, everything? Now remember, that doesn't go on today. That's not our calling in the church. It's not our calling of any nation. God has set up leaders over the nations, he says now, and government has authority over certain areas, but not over the world. But in this period, Israel had authority under God to be a judgment to the nations. They were to declare the gospel to the nations, and they were to be an instrument of justice. So if you want to write in your Bible, just write war crimes. That would be how we would describe it today. There's war crimes going on, and he's decided that war crimes are going to be dealt with, just like Hitler was dealt with. And we talk about Hitler all the time. He, he put to death six million people, Stalin and Lenin put to death somewhere between 40 and, million, uh, 40 and 50 million people, some people say, around 40 million people. Uh, they made Hitler look like a choir boy. And the way they killed people and what they did to families, it's disgusting. I don't know another word. You take Mussolini and you take all the people, you could just name them. God at some time in time and place, and time, he says, that's enough. That's enough. So Israel is an instrument of justice. God had promised Joshua that the Amalekites would be killed. They've had hundreds of years to repent. Their war crimes are still going on. They are attacking people, raping, taking land, killing people, putting people into slavery. So their evil continues. God says uh, that's enough. Matter of fact, if you look at verse 33, he says when, when, when the prophet finally goes and kills Amalek, he says, for you making women childless. That's war crimes. For you taking people and putting them in slavery and killing them and leaving families without dads and so forth, you're going to die. Now, here's something important when you read the text. Not only Israel belongs to God, but all the nations belong to God. The, the Amalekites, they belong to God. So their time is up. They've had hundreds of years, and now their time is up. So here's what Saul is commanded. He's commanded to do all the Lord says period. This is a test for him. Will you do all that I say? There's a couple parts of this that are a test because he has to get rid of the best of oxen, the best of sheep, the best of the camels, the best of the donkeys. Look on your note sheet, John 14, 15. Just apply it to us. Jesus said, let's read it out loud. You ready? If you love me, you obey my commandments. So obedience is not optional if we want to show people we love God. Obedience is not optional if we want to show people we love God. If you love me, he said, you obey my commands. It's a, it's a way to show people that we love God is how we obey him. He thought, Saul thought, obedience was optional. He thought he could choose when to obey and when not to obey. Look at John 15, 14. Jesus said, let's read it out loud. You ready? You are my friends if you do what I command. So here's the other aspect of obedience. Obedience is what brings intimacy with God. Obedience enhances intimacy with God. In that text, he says, you're no longer my servants. I don't just call you servants. I call you friends. A friend is someone you meet face to face with. A friend is someone you tell your life story to. A friend is someone you pray with. A friend is someone you do life with. He says, now you're not just my servants, you're my intimate friends. Obedience is what grows us in deeper intimacy with God. That's where Saul failed. He, didn't, he thought obedience was optional, but he didn't want to grow deeper with God and he had no intimacy. So let's take it to us men, and everybody can do this. What would enhance your friendship with God? Just write it down. Is there anything on your mind or heart? Or write the question down. What would enhance your friendship with God? Not your obedience. 
It may be obedience that enhances it. What would enhance your friendship? In what way specifically, you might say, how would I start obeying God that would enhance my intimacy, my friendship with God, to where he tells me more? Jesus said to his disciples, you do what I command. He said, I'll tell you more. We say it all the time here. Be faithful with the little, you get more. So he said, what, what he's saying to us, what step is it, what action step is it that it would cause us to grow in deeper intimacy? Over the years, you've probably grown with somebody like that a wife, a friend, somebody you served in the military with, and you, you could count on them, and they were there for you, and you took steps of faith with God, and it grew you deeper. It's the same way with God. Third, he told him to walk by faith and not by sight. So he tells him that he's to love the Lord and his word. He tells him, to, he tells him that he's to fully obey the Lord, and he tells him that he must walk by faith and not by sight. Jump down to verse 9. If you look at verse 9, it says, but, and that's a big word, so the Lord has spoken. Lord God has spoken, but Saul and the people spared Agag, and they spared the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. Underline that word good. They, they assessed what was good. They were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised. You might want to underline that word. They're making judgment statements, judgments about the, the flock. And so what they despise, they, keep, they, they get rid of. What's worthless, they get rid of. So what's best and good, they keep. What's despised and worthless in their eyes, they utterly destroy. So you can see they go part way on their obedience, and they say, well, we'll destroy what's not needed, and we'll keep what's good, though God has told them to get rid of all of it. And here's what happens to us, and we do the same. They focused on what they thought would get them to the next level or the next place. We're all theological beings. We're all goal-driven. And they said, here's what will get us to the next goal. And so they focus on the best. They keep the best. And they say, we'll get rid of the worst. One of the big things today is virtual reality. You know, where you put something on and you play a game and you kind of join in with it and you feel like you're there and there's, you know, a war going on or you're back to the Garden of Eden or whatever it could be. It can be all kinds of stuff. And so I went and looked. I was, some people told me that they got this game and how much they enjoyed it and, and I didn't get to see it, but I, I went and looked up what virtual reality means. Now listen to this. Here's what it means. There's nothing wrong with it, but I just want you to hear the definition. It's a computer or artificially generated stimulus that causes a seemingly real experience. It's a seemingly real experience. It's not bad. It's not bad to play. I mean, it depends on what you're playing, what videos you're watching, what movies we watch, right? But it's a seemingly real experience. That's what happens when we live by sight, not by faith. It seems and feels so real. Isn't it interesting in your life, if you look back, if you've been walking with Christ for a while, how many times you went backwards in the eyes of other people to go forwards? You didn't take a job that had more money so you could stay with your children? Or you forgave somebody that kept hurting you in faith that God might change their life? I mean, you went ahead and did it and forgave them and told them? Or you moved to a place that it wasn't a bigger church, it was a less church or you know, whatever it might be. But in the eyes of other people, you went backwards to go forwards. This is a real test for him. He says, I want you to go backwards on this day to go forwards. I want you to take what you could make money of, off of, what you could eat, what you could feed the people with. I want you to go backwards today so you can go forwards. I want you to trust me. Hebrews 11:6. Right there on your sheet. He says, without faith, without totally trusting God and believing in Him, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near, here's that phrase again, it goes back not to just knowing doctrine, but drawing near to God. Who would draw near to God must believe that He exists, that He is who He says He is and He exists, and that He rewards those who seek Him. That last phrase has become more real to me as I've gotten older. It didn't mean as much to me in my 20s, or my 30s, or my 40s. It means a lot more to me now 
that my body's not doing what I thought it would do, that things aren't going the way I thought, that everybody's not listening to my advice all the time, which is crazy, that, the, that, that my dogs won't listen, my, my children won't listen, my grandchildren won't listen. I, it's just crazy, the people that won't listen to me, and things don't go well. I must believe at times that he rewards those who seek him though it's not happening in the moment. If I go by sight, I get discouraged, I get angry, I get frustrated just as I got up and confessed in front of you last week, I get disappointed, all those things happen. He gets to the, he gets to the, the flock and he makes a judgment and he says, here's what would help my portfolio. Here's what would help me with the people. Here's what helps me in my business adventure. Here's what would help me in my life. And he leaves God out. Those who would go forwards must often go backwards. So especially men, would you write down this question? Where's God calling you backwards to go backwards to go forwards? And I mean backwards in the sight of the world. Is God calling you to go backwards in order to go forwards anywhere? Is he calling you to put something off? Is he calling you to do opposite of what the world says? Is he calling you to take a lesser job? Is he calling you to give up something? Is he calling you to go backwards so you can go forwards with him? I was talking to a friend this week, and he was talking about a friend that's jumped from church to church to church. He's only stayed at a church every three to four years, and now he's at a, a mega church. And he said, he said to him one day, he said, has God always called you to go to a bigger church every single time? And he said, yes, that's one of the blessings of walking with God. And he said, what if God called you to go to a smaller church and focus on discipleship? He's, they're, they're, this guy's very big in discipleship. They run about 200 people. It, same way, you know, with me, be out and people be talking and all, and he'll say, well, we got 200 people, but we're focusing on discipleship. So he's very comfortable in his own skin. So he's talking to his friend, and he says, how are you discipling the people? And the guy says, well, we're not there yet. We're not a discipleship church. We don't really help people grow deeper yet, but we're going to get there. And he said, what if God called you to go backwards to go forwards? And this is a pretty solid guy. And the guy said, God would never do that. And I know he meant well. I, I, I think he had something in his mind. He had to be thinking something about what God was doing. But I think, I think that's more real for most of us than we think. He just said it out open out in the open. God sometimes calls you to go backwards, to go forwards. Four, choose to please God over people. Choose pleasing God over people. You know what? This one's so important. Let's say this out loud like we mean it. You ready? Choose pleasing God over people. This has been my struggle all my life. It's been some of your struggles I've met with you. This is a tough one. You never totally outgrow it, peer pressure, those kind of things. You just get better at it. You just, you just grow more mature. Go to the first part of verse 9. Go back to verse 9. I just want to show you that first phrase. Verse 9, Saul and the people spared Agag. He spared Agag. Now the question is, what's going on in the culture that might make him spare Agag? Well, what's going on is he wants to make a name for himself in front of the people. God told him to put this man to death for his war crimes. And Saul overlooks everybody he's attacked, everybody he's had raped, every village he's burned, every city he's destroyed, every child he's killed. And he says, I'm going to spare his life. Why would somebody spare somebody like that? Well, listen to this quote from a commentator. Saul was after a name for himself. He was after his own kingdom. He was after his own stature. That's why he spared Agag and kept him prisoner. Refusing to kill Agag was not an act of mercy. In this day, having an enemy king in your prison was an enormous status boost in front of your people. In those days, conquering kings would frequently parade all the kings they had captured. They would be emaciated, they would be in chains, and they would be assigned to the world I am the conquering king. I defeated these people. I'm the king of kings. Like a conquering king, Saul parades the spoils of war in front of his people, 
the people that he so desperately needed their approval. He needed their approval. So he makes himself a status boost here. He takes his king. He keeps him. He imprisons him. He parades him around. And he says, I did this. I won this victory. It's so, as though he doesn't believe that God can make a name for himself. It doesn't, he doesn't believe that in due time God will lift him up. So I was looking at my life this week, as I often do in the text, and I think of the times where I exaggerated, and I can't remember every time, but I can remember a couple of key times where I exaggerated, or I lied, or I, I backed down from people and didn't speak the truth. And I was thinking about this week some times that really stood out to me, and I was praying about it, and I think about what did they have in common? Why why would I, in Christ, do those things? Well, one, I was putting myself first. I was, I was putting myself first instead of God. But the second thing is people's approval became way too important to me. Their approval became more important than God's approval. I understand what he's doing here. The problem is he made it a way of life. You know, all of us at times do this. What we do when the Holy Spirit convicts us is the main thing. What we do when the Spirit convicts us. Look at Galatians 1.10. Paul said, <clears throat> Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Underline trying to please people. Isn't that a great phrase? It never gets accomplished. He said, back when I was religious, remember he was a Jew of Jews, a gen he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he taught the law, he knew it all. He said, I tried to please people. It never gets accomplished. You can't do it. It just won't work. He said, I was trying to please people. It became a way of life. He said, if I were still doing that, I couldn't be a servant of Christ. That's a great reminder in this generation that Jesus said they often... He didn't say sometimes. He said they often will not go together. Matter of fact, he said most of the time, much of the time, the world will hate you. Paul said the more Christ-like you become, you will be persecuted. So here's something we can write down for men and, and for all of us. Am I being persecuted because I so seek God's approval? Just write it down. And when's the last time I got hurt or persecuted or wronged because I chose God over others. I think that's a good thing for us to think about because this is a society where it's easy to blend in and be comfortable. And he doesn't say, hey, go look to be beat up. He's not saying that. He's saying, though, that if I walk with Christ and if we walk with Christ, there's going to be a time where people will not agree. Number five, live authentically in private and in public. In other words, live the same in private and in public. We've talked about this a lot, that there's always a gap, right? There's a gap between what we, what we want to be and, and where we're going and who we really are. And so we want that gap to shorten. And over time, we want to look more like Christ, especially the people that, that are watching us that really count, you know, the people who know us the best in our homes and in our friendships, we want them to see that our words and actions match together. There's a gap always till we get to see the Lord. We want that gap to shorten. His gap just kept getting bigger. Verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret, and when God says this, it means I hurt greatly. <clears throat> I hurt greatly. This greatly pains me that I made Saul king. Later on in the text, he's going to say, I don't regret like a man. So he doesn't regret like we do. It's an anthropomorphism. It means I really hurt over this. It means you're breaking my heart. You, you, this breaks my heart. Our, our three-year-old uh, granddaughter, she's still trying to put words together, and she got a pop-pop this week, you know. She got a little spanking, and it's nothing. Like, it's a little pop-pop. It just hurts her heart more than anything. And she looks at her mom and she says, you are cracking my heart. You're cracking it. You're just cracking it. And uh, Jordan said she just had to turn around and smile and then go give her a pop-pop. So he says, uh, this cracks, this breaks my heart. That's a big word, for, that's a big phrase for God. 
this hurts me. You can see how, how relational the Lord is, even with people who disobey Him. This breaks my heart that I made Saul king. He has turned back from following me. Circle that if you want to. He's turned back from following me. This is the key of the whole passage. He turned away from me, turned away from my eyes. He turned away from faith. He turned away from pleasing me. He turned back from following me. And, circle this, he's not carried out my commandments. He turned away from me, which automatically means he disobeyed me. He turned away from me. He disobeyed me. That's his life. And Samuel was distressed, and he cried out to the Lord all night. I, I thought that was interesting. The people who are close to God, they hurt the most over other people's sins. They hurt the most over their spouse's sins, over their children's sins. He is, he's hurt. He's breaking over Saul's sins. He's crying out to God at night. He has God's heart. Go to verse 13. 13, Samuel called to Saul. Saul said to him, blessed are you of the Lord. I've carried out the command of the Lord. So the pastor comes, and you see there's a, it, it's a in Hebrew, it's a, it's a, he's screaming, and he says, hey, pastor, I did what you said to do. And he says it in front of all the people. He wants the people's approval. And there's all these sheep around, and oxen, and all this stuff going around. And it, all of them, they're walking around. He says, I did what you said to do. And the text says he built a monument for himself. He started a praise service, which he was going to be the center of it. And now he says to the pastor in front of the people, I did what you said to do. And he wants them all to hear it. We were with a group of people recently, Glenn and I were, and they were so excited about their church, and they just went on and on. They just went on and on. And I thought later I, we tried to change, we were seeking to change the subject, and we kept changing it, and they just kept going back to their church, just like I used to do. I used to get up here and tell people, I'd say, remember, tell people we're the fastest growing church in Erie. We've got the first praise band in Erie. We're doing this, we're doing that. That's what Saul's doing. It's not about God. It's not about, it's about his ministry, it's about life. So those, are, those are dangerous things. Not that we should not be proud sometimes of our church, but sometimes I just wonder as I listen to myself and people are really proud about Christ. Verse 14, Samuel said, well, what then is this bleeding, this noise of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Samuel hears the disingenuine speech that, King Saul is giving because he sees all the sheep and all the oxen that he's supposed to kill. Samuel knew this was not true. So what makes him say it's true out loud? How did the gap get so big in his life? I mean, the people knew. He, he knew. A pastor's wife once told me that her husband is the greatest man alive one hour every Sunday. You know, the people around us know. They know. How did Saul get so deceived? Well, his private life didn't match his public life to where it got confusing. See, eventually, Jesus said, you'll serve one master or the other, and he wanted to serve the people, and his private life and his public life didn't go together, and eventually it started spilling out. It's a slow fade like that song by Casting Crowns. It's just, it's one decision, it's a little decision. Often it's people that are around us saying, that's okay, it's no big deal. I'm sure he had a lot of yes people around him. Just slow decisions. So men, would you write down, is there anywhere you're fading away? Would you, is there anywhere that the Lord would say to you that you know that you're fading away? You're fading away from depth, you're fading away from passion, you're fading away from risk. You're fading away from going after the Lord deeper. Is there anywhere you're fading away? Is there anywhere your private life and public life don't match? It's worth looking at. Number six, own our attitudes and our actions. And Saul just can't do that. In verse 15, it says, Saul said, they, that's his whole thing here, they brought me the, the stuff from the Amalekites, the people, there it is, the people spared the best of the sheep, the oxen, to sacrifice to the Lord. He, he says he puts a spiritual twist to it. They wanted to have sacrificed you. The people made me do it. But the rest they utterly destroyed. It's like Adam and Eve, you know, throwing around 
to blame every direction. And we're all hypocritical in this area. We blame others, all that. But again, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, what we do with it is crucial. So men, would you write this down? Am I owning my own attitudes and actions? If you're not sure, ask a couple people. Are you owning your own attitude and actions? Or do you justify? Do you blame? Do you look at other people for how you feel emotionally and how you're living? Do I own them? Number seven, remember God's grace. Let's say that out loud. You ready? Remember God's grace. Isn't it amazing in the Old Testament? How many times the gospel comes up or grace comes up? I grew up in a generation where people talked about like it's God. There's one God of the Old Testament, one God of the New Testament, but you don't see that in the Bible. You see this loving, faithful God in the midst of some really bad situations. Verse 16 Samuel said to Saul, wait, and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel the prophet said, it is true that you were little in your own eyes, and you were made head of the tribes of Israel. Weren't you nobody at one time? Didn't God make you head of Israel? You didn't make yourself head of Israel. It was by grace. And wasn't it the Lord that anointed you king over Israel? You didn't, you didn't politic for being king. Nobody voted you in. How did you get to be king? And wasn't it the Lord that sent you on a mission? Didn't the Lord give you a new purpose in life and a new mission? And didn't he say, go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them till they're exterminated? Didn't he say it's time to deal with their war crimes and they're not to kill any more people? And you're going to let this cruel bunch of people live? Why? Verse 19, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but you rushed upon the treasure, the spoil, and you did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? What ego you have that you'd edge God out, that you'd think you were king on your own, that you were head over Israel on your own, that you could change the mission of God, that you could change the word of God, that you could pick and choose when you obey. He said, how did you get this way? He's wanting, to him, he's wanting him to examine his heart. Romans 3.24, just to remind us about us, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's how you got saved. This will make you forever grateful, forever humble, forever joyful if you believe it, that God saved you as a gift by His grace, His unmerited favor, His pleasure to do it. It pleased Him to do it on His own. It is through the redemption, the buying back of Christ Jesus that He purchased us, that He paid for us. I want to invite you today to believe in Christ Jesus, to believe in His redemption, to believe in His cross, to believe in His blood that was shared, to believe in His perfection, to believe in His sufficiency, and to tell Him so, and to bow yourself to Him. Receive His grace. 1 Corinthians 15.10, he says, about your daily life, when you live daily life, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Let's read that out loud. You ready? By the grace of God, I am what I am. I had a picture on the screen here. Alex Haley used to, he had a picture. He wrote Roots, you remember? And he had a picture of a turtle on top of a fence. And people would come in, and they'd see the turtle on the fence post, and they would ask him about it. And he would ask people, he said, how do you think it got there? And they would say something about he was a great writer, he did this and he did that. And he said, I'm like that turtle. And anytime you see a turtle on a fence post, you know one thing for sure. Somebody put it there. I want to remind you today, just I want to remind you of something you already know. If you have grit, if you've got determination, if you have a great IQ, if you as drop-dead gorgeous, if you are a persevering person, if you're a good businessman or woman, if you're a good leader, if you're a good mom, if you're a good dad, anything you have was given to you as a gift. Anything. You say, well, don't we cultivate it? Don't we grow in it? Yeah. How do you do it? Grace. 
He gave you the health to do it. He put you in this century. He put you in this country. He put people around you. And you could just go on and on. He gave you the DNA. I mean, it never ends. And Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he said, don't praise me. Anything I have, it's God. Saul was the exact opposite. He makes a monument for himself. He starts a praise service for himself. And he tells everybody how wonderful he is. He's the exact opposite. 1 Corinthians 131, last one, let's read it. Ready? As it's written, let those who boast, boast in the Lord. Boasting means to praise, to announce, to celebrate, or to talk a lot about. So he says, if you're going to talk a lot about something, praise something, celebrate something, let it be the Lord. Don't let it be your church. Don't let it be your accomplishments. Don't let it be your pastor. Don't let it be even your wife, or your husband, or your children. Let it be the Lord. Let it be the Lord. Now, this is a disgusting story. So if you don't want to hear it, just put your hand, fingers in your ears, okay? Now you want to hear it, don't you? Now you like, I got up this morning. I have such a terrible time with sinuses. Most of you have been around here, you know, a lot of times I lose my voice. So it's dark 30 something in the morning and I can't breathe so I go in and I put my saline in like I often do I blow my nose and the most disgusting stuff you've ever seen comes out and I just I'm like a child sometimes and maybe it's a man thing but I just had to touch it you ever do that I just had to I just had to see you know I'm sorry that's how I am and so I'm holding it. I'm thinking, I mean, it's got blood in it. It's thick. And so I wash it off. And like I'm standing there and I'm thinking, I think I could do this again. And I blow again. And there it does. It does it again. And it's this glob of stuff. And I, I just, I'm telling myself, don't touch it. And I touch it. I pick it up. <laughs> Smell it, you know, all this stuff. So I wash it down the drain. I almost... <laughs> I almost woke Glenn up, and that would, have been a, that would have been a disaster. It's a man thing. So the men are doing this. The women are saying, oh, my God. So I blow that out. I go in the other room. I sit down. I go through my, the message again, and I'm praying. And so it comes to my mind where Paul said to the Philippians, he said, anything that you would praise me for, any of my accomplishments is dung, excrement. It's just, it's just body fluid. And it can be translated like stuff that comes out of your nose or stuff that comes out of your rear end. It's a very intense word. And it's in the Bible. Years ago, I was reading a, various translations about this. And one translation says, dung, you know. So I go to my professor and I say, does this really mean this? And he said, oh yeah. He said, we soften it. He said, anything Paul said that people would praise me for, accomplishments, grit, determination, how big the church got, how well I'm passionate, being beaten up, stoned, shipwrecked. He said, it's, it's what comes out of my body. He said, I preach Christ, Paul then. I preach Christ. Well, you can boast, you know, with your words. But the Bible says you can also boast with your life. You can live a certain way that becomes a boast unto the Lord, a praise unto the Lord. But the only way you can do it is to remember God's grace. It's all about him. He's glorifying himself through you to reach the nations, which means your school, your workplace, your home, your neighborhood. And he wants to work through you so that people would say, that man does not boast about his church or his children or his wife as much as he boasts about the Lord. He can do that in you. And he can glorify his name through you. And do not let the enemy tell you 
that he can't because of your past. That's the people he specializes in to say, oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. Father, what a great text for men and for leaders and for women, but especially us men. We tend to boast about ourselves. We tend to boast about our work, our accomplishments, our degrees, everything else. Lord, thank you for reminding us that you not only saved us by grace, but everything that makes us what we are is because you did it. And Lord, let our boast with our life, our words, our speech, the way we respond to people, the way we treat people, the way we live, the way we forgive, the way we're gracious to people who let us down, let it all be a boast unto the Lord. I pray... Lord, that we could be said about us that we are men after God's own heart. And then I pray, and I pray that we're praying this together, that we would never concern ourselves with how many seats we fill. I do pray that, Father. I am so over that. I do pray that we be men who pour our lives into other men, that they could become men of grace, men of God that we'd be serious about discipling, intentionally discipling other men to love you, to love others, and for them to make disciples. Father, I'm going to ask that every man in here right now ask in faith that we would have spiritual grandchildren, not just children, but children's children, that we'd have grandchildren in the faith people we pour into that would pour into others. I pray that would mark this church. I ask you in faith, so I expect it, that you'll do it. Lord, as we greet one another, I pray we'd boast together that we know Christ. And if there's anybody here that doesn't know you in that way, in a loving, surrendered relationship. I pray that he or she would put his trust in you right here in this place. Right here. And go public and be baptized as an act of obedience, as a declaration that they've surrendered to you. That they get in a group and grow up and be strengthened. And Lord, they would be on mission for you, not themselves. Lord, do this for your glory and for our enjoyment. And God's people said, Amen. God bless.